Hi, this is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me today. Today we're gonna to be talking about one of the most important pieces of gear in your studio. And that is your studio, your actual room that you're working in. I'm a big evangelist for acoustic treatment, getting the acoustics in your room done right so you can trust what you're hearing and so that you can get the most out of your speakers, whatever speakers you are working with. Thanks to KRK, I have a lovely set of the KRK Generation 4 Rocket 7s here, we get to do a three-part series that is all about getting the most out of your speakers and room. And I'm really psyched for this one on acoustic treatment because I think if you take some of these principles and apply them in your studio, you're going to have much better results than ever before. And you can do this really inexpensively with some DIY acoustic treatment solutions, which we'll talk about a bit. And they're also commercial off-the-shelf solutions for acoustic treatment as well that can be really, really cost-effective and time-effective. We'll talk about that too. But just so that I can sell you on it a little bit more, I want to let you know that no matter what kind of speaker budget I had to work with, whether that was little, as little as $300 or as much as $30,000, I wouldn't necessarily spend that entire budget just on speakers. I would absolutely, absolutely save some of my speaker budget for acoustic treatment in your room because your acoustic treatment is going to get you a lot more out of your speakers. And I would rather have a more affordable set of speakers like the KRK Rocket Series in a really well-treated room than a more expensive set of speakers in a room with no treatment. So this is huge. Obviously, if you only have a few hundred dollars to spend overall, your acoustic treatment solutions are probably going to be DIY. But as your budget goes up, you may be able to warrant some commercially made acoustic panels. We'll look at some of mine and I'll give you a sense for the types of different acoustic panels and where you should be placing them. And we'll also go into some overall design philosophy on where you should be placing your panels in your room, what size panels you should get, what kind of panels you should get to get the most out of your room and your speakers. This is huge because good acoustic treatment allows you to effectively widen the sweet spot in your room. Not only can you make the sweet spot where you're going to be working sound better, but you can ameliorate some of those issues where when you move a little bit this way or move a little bit that way, the bass response totally changes, which is common in a lot of studios that are left untreated. One quick disclaimer I want to give you is that we are talking about acoustic treatment today, not soundproofing. Soundproofing is a topic in and of itself. Soundproofing is about stopping sound from getting into your studio or out of your studio or room. And that is a little bit more complex and often a little bit more expensive than acoustic treatment because it really means doing some additional construction, adding thickness to walls, or ideally creating a room within a room. And we can talk about soundproofing another day. But acoustic treatment is all about getting the sound in your room to be better. This is super important for what you're hearing out of your speakers to make sure that you can trust the frequency response you're getting out of your speakers and it's also important because it'll make everything that you record in your room sound even better, whether it's acoustic guitar or vocal or drums or anything else. Some acoustic treatment on the walls is going to help sweeten the sounds that you record as well as make the sounds that you hear that much more trustworthy. All right, let's get right into it. There are essentially three types of acoustic treatment. There are absorbers, broadband absorbers, and that's actually what you're seeing here. Any of these red burgundy panels in my room are just straight up broadband absorption. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit more detail in just a minute. Then there are bass traps or resonant absorbers, and these operate on a different principle, and we'll talk about those in a minute. And then there are diffusers, and this is actually a very simple diffuser that has some absorption built into it. And the idea behind a diffuser is it's kind of about scattering some of the reflections. All right, so first we need to talk about the problems that you're going to have if you don't have any acoustic treatment. 
One is problems in the low end. And this is often one of the things that people are going to struggle the most to fix. And this is because there are room modes, room nodes, standing waves. Bass really builds up within a room, often has trouble escaping a room. And in square and rectangular shaped rooms, these room modes and room nodes can be a lot more of an issue than in specially designed studios that try to avoid parallel surfaces. So that's going to be one of the things that we're going to want to address. Another big issue that you're going to run into are things like flutter echo. If you clap your hands in a room, you may hear a fluttery sound coming off of the walls, often a kind of ringing effect, a little bit of a, a kind of a reverby, almost slappy kind of sound. And you don't hear that much of it in here because there's some decent acoustic treatment in here. And that can be annoying. A, when you're listening, it's going to kind of lie to you about how wet or dry your mix is. And B, when you're recording, it can end up coloring the sounds of acoustic instruments or voices that you end up recording within that room environment. So getting rid of those two things, tamping down on the flutter echo and Controlling the low frequencies are the two big things we're looking to do with acoustic treatment. Now, I will tell you that getting rid of flutter echo is the relatively easy part. The harder part, and the part that most people are the most interested in, is getting your low end better in your room. I will tell you that there are certain products that really aren't going to go very, very deep. There are two general types of things you could make an absorber panel out of. You could make it out of foam or you could make it out of fiberglass. And the panels that I have here, I'll show you one a little more closely in just a moment, are made out of fiberglass. They are a rigid fiberglass. The most common ones you'll find are Owens Corning 703, Owens Corning 705. Those are the most common types of rigid fiberglass insulation that are going to be found inside of panels. And that's just the make and model. Owens Corning is a big maker of rigid fiberglass. Fiberglass is, you know, the pink cotton candy stuff that you're going to see in your attic or between your walls. But when it's really rigid and really tightly compacted, it actually makes a very good absorber of sound. And if you get it thick enough, the thicker and thicker that you get it, the more low frequency that you can absorb. You'd have to get panels very, very thick in order to absorb all the low frequencies you'd want to. But there's kind of a little cheat or a hack that you can do to make these panels go even deeper in their absorption without making it so that they're like a foot deep. And that is to mount your panels in corners and away from walls. Just getting a little bit of distance between the absorptive material and the wall can be big in increasing the lowest frequency or <laughs> decreasing the lowest frequency, making the frequency as effective at even lower and lower. In general, to start getting effective at kind of sub frequencies, you'd want to look at something maybe about six inches thick. And the best place to hang those would be in the corner. And you can see in the corners of my room, there are six inch panels starting from the ceiling, going down towards the floor. Those are six inches deep. And because they are mounted in a corner, it makes them effective at a relatively low frequency. These other panels here, you'll see are a little bit thinner. This absorber is, I think this is one of my four inch panels, but you'll see it has a little bit of recessing in the back. And this is something you might want to build into DIY designs of your own. There's a little bit of a gap here between where the actual fiberglass is and where it would attach to the wall. So that'll make it operate at a slightly deeper frequency. And you may want to consider that for your own designs if you're going to build panels like these for yourself. This kind of panel comes from a brand called GIK. They're one of many makers of commercial panels. I didn't make my own because, to be honest, I don't really have the time these days to make or even hang my own panels. So I ordered these in. But there was a time in my career in audio where I had much more time than money coming in. And it made a lot of sense for me to do things like build my own acoustic treatment. And I did from some DIY kits that are out there. There are some great options. And there's a number of brands that you could look at 
for pre-made stuff. There is real traps, ready traps, GIK acoustics, so many others, but you can also look at building your own out of the raw materials. Generally, Owens Corning 703 and Owens Corning 705 being the most common choices. We'll talk more about that in a minute. This other type of panel here is called the diffuser, and we'll promise we'll get to those fun things in just a sec. But before we do, I want to talk about other approaches to bass control, and that is bass trapping. Like I said, you need fairly thick panels, and you want to separate them from the wall a little bit, ideally by starting hanging them in corners, and that will get you some decent low frequency control. If you've got at least six inches thick, hang it in a corner, that'll do something good. If you want to go even further in acoustic treatment, you can look at something called a bass trap. And bass traps operate from a very different principle. Rather than these broadband absorbers, which are going to absorb everything, including the low frequencies, a bass trap is uh, something that is tuned to resonate along with a specific frequency and dampen it that way. Bass traps are maybe a little bit harder to do DIY. The construction actually isn't that complicated, but you need to do a little bit more math. And generally, you're going to be working with an acoustician who would help you design and make bass traps for your room. If you're a little bit more ambitious, you have some decent carpentry skills, and you're not afraid of a little bit of math, what you could do is test the sound in your room using some kind of measurement microphone, find where the most significant peaks or nulls in the bass are in your listening position, and then make some tuned absorbers to help you specifically with those frequencies. And that kind of thing happens a lot in you know, major commercial studio builds. The actual, you know, equipment and construction that goes into building bass traps isn't that expensive. We're still using, you know, cloth and wood and, you know, some fairly basic materials, but they need to be designed in such a way that they really resonate at specifically that frequency, dampening that frequency specifically. So that's not something I recommend to most DIY studio builders or most kind of entry-level project studios. That's probably something for a slightly more ambitious build. But if you are a little bit ambitious, you have an acoustician you can work with, or you're really into building stuff and doing a little bit of math, building your own bass traps is something you could potentially look at. There's also things that work a little bit like bass traps, uh, other things that work almost like a jug, where if you've ever blown in a jug and you know heard the sound, where they will resonate based on some little openings, and those kinds of resonators can also be used to control mid-frequencies. Those are a little less common, but sometimes those are put into more sophisticated studio designs. All right, so we've covered our two first main types of acoustic treatment. The next thing we want to talk about are diffusers. And here is a very simple diffusion design. You can see more of them hanging up on the back wall. And some diffusers are much more significant than this. But the idea with diffusion is it is meant to, instead of absorb reflections off walls, to kind of scatter them into a million different directions. And this helps reduce the coloration you get from the walls, and it helps reduce that amount of kind of like a uh, pingy flutter echo effect. And the beautiful thing about these is they can help keep the room a little bit more live. So they can solve some of your flutter echo problems just like an absorber would, but they can do that without really deadening the entire room. So adding some diffusion to a room can help it from becoming too dead while still controlling some of those issues. It can also help your room kind of sound and feel a little bit more like a larger room. When you have diffusers, say, on the back wall, that's the most common place to put some diffusers, it kind of makes that back wall almost disappear acoustically a little bit. And it really does give the space a sense of acoustically sounding and feeling a little larger and a little less confused find. And especially if you're going to be doing some recording in a room, it can be nice to make sure it's not 
too overly deadened and putting some diffusion into the mix can be useful. This particular kind of diffuser has an absorber behind it. So frequencies that aren't getting diffused are getting absorbed, which is handy. And there's a lot of designs like that. At my old studio where I did almost all of my mastering, the past Joe Lambert mastering, I still work with those guys, I still manage all of my clients for me, they have a similar concept, a different design, but wood on the front and absorption on the back. And that's one popular way to go with diffusion. Another very popular way to go with diffusion, especially for people who are doing DIY builds, is to just use wood. And this can be done in ways that are kind of haphazard and by the seat of your pants. I've even, even seen studios that have just a whole bunch of logs in the back of their space kind of acting as a homemade, you know, pretty looking diffuser. Or they can be done very intentionally to get really random different sizes and just a whole bunch of wood blocks sticking out of the wall at differing lengths is something that is fairly common and you'll see in some higher end studios. So diffusion can be a nice thing to add on. There's some inexpensive DIY solutions you could make out of bunches of wood, or there are some fairly inexpensive commercial solutions like this one by GIK, but also others by plenty of other brands from Oralex to Real Traps to Ready Tracks to ATS Acoustics and so many others I'm probably forgetting to name at the moment. Okay, the last big thing we want to think about is where to put these. And we covered that already with your first and most important set of acoustic treatment elements, which are going to be your low frequency absorbers, some six inch panels in those corners. If you're on a budget, you can go for less than six inches, but the thicker you go, the deeper they're going to be effective. For all of your other panels, there are some rules of thumb about where you might want to put these. And I'll give you two tricks for figuring out where to put your other panels. Now, since your other panels, the ones not mounted in the corners, are really meant to control your flutter, echo, and early reflections more than anything else, it's okay if you're saving some money on other panels in the room if they're not as thick as six inches. And just getting some one or two inch panels for elsewhere in your room can really help you do things in a very cost-effective way while still taking care of some of those flutter, echo, and early reflection issues. Two good principles for where to place these additional ones are a point halfway between your speaker and listening position. That's often a good place to look to put your absorption on either the walls or the ceiling above you. The halfway point between your listening position and your speakers, that is a good place to look at potentially putting some acoustic panels. That's not the only thing. Another good trick to use here is the mirror trick. This one takes an assistant. But if you and a friend can get into the room together and your friend can hold up a mirror on the wall, anywhere where you can look at the mirror and see the speakers in that mirror, that is a potentially good place to put one of your absorbers. This is because much like light would bounce off a mirror to your eye, sound waves from the speaker would bounce off the walls to your ear. So anywhere where you can see a speaker in a mirror is a good place to think about putting an absorber to stop those sound waves from bouncing off the wall into your ear and creating kind of smearing effects. Even just doing some control in this way, getting rid of flutter echo and first reflections at these first reflection points, is going to make your bass potentially feel a little bit tighter because you end up having a less smeary mid-range, so all of a sudden things down low can feel a little bit crisper to you. But generally, these smaller panels hung right on the wall aren't going to be as effective as the thicker panels in the corner, so I recommend a mix of both. If you can do even just four six inch panels in the corner in a rectangular room. Ideally, you can do them floor to ceiling. And ideally, maybe you can put six inch panels elsewhere. If you can do that, you're gonna be in a better place for your low end. And then for any other budget remaining, you can maybe look at those smaller panels. And how many you need really depends to a degree on your budget. But if you're doing this commercially, I would say that most rooms that most people are going to be working in, you can get tremendous results spending anywhere between $1,000 and $2,000 on pre-made panels. But you can cut numbers like that in half 
or less if you are resourceful in building them yourself and scouting out appropriate materials. If you're not super worried about the low end or you don't have speakers that go super duper deep, you can probably skimp a little bit more on the thicker panels, which are going to be the most expensive part of things. And you can always do this bit by bit. Start with a few panels and just spending, you know, a few hundred bucks and make some significant improvements in your room and just make this one of those things that you add on bit by bit by bit. If you're not ready to do it all at once, doing even a little bit to start can be a big help. And even if it's not ideal yet, you can go in the right direction pretty quickly without spending too, too much money or too much time. One of the other big things here is placing your speakers properly. And we cover that in the other video in this series. Check it out if you haven't already. I'll make sure to link to it here and in the show notes down below. But if you get your speakers into a good place to begin with, you're going to have a lot less trouble getting the most out of your speakers. But then there's an additional part to this equation, and that is EQ. Even if you got great speakers and you got them in a well-treated room, it's never going to be 100% perfect. But EQ can often help take you even further. And some of the EQ solutions that are out there today are better than ever. And we'll talk about that in the next installment in this series. KRK, who is sponsoring this series, has a really ingenious EQ system built right in where you can actually take out your phone, use it to measure the frequency response coming out of your speakers, and it automatically recommends EQ settings that you can do on the back of these speakers to get you even closer to having as neutral sound as possible. More on that very soon. For now, big thanks to KRK for allowing us to bring you this three-part series absolutely for free. I am looking right now at the KRK Rocket G4s. That's a fourth generation. These are the Rocket 7s. These are probably some of the best selling studio monitors in the history of the world. And for good reason. They're fun to listen to, but still neutral enough to be really useful in the studio. And you'll see their next series up, the V series, in some very major mixers studios. They're favorites of some really significant producer engineers. And you also see the Rockets as main monitors in a lot of great project studios and as secondary monitors in even bigger rooms. So they're a lot of fun, but also they have one of the more ingenious and effective EQ solutions built into their speakers. We'll talk about that more in a little bit, as well as a totally great smartphone app that you can check out for free. Just type in KRK wherever you get your apps. It's got a real-time analyzer to help you figure out the frequency response in your room. It has got a feature that will help you get the tilt just right on your speakers, the spacing just right between your speakers, the phase just right between your speakers. So definitely check out that free resource. Just type in KRK wherever you get your smartphone and tablet apps. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Did you like this video? If so, remember to like and subscribe down below. Hit that notifications bell so you don't miss any of the other videos in this series. Do you have questions of your own about acoustic treatment, where to place it, what kinds to get? Definitely let me know in the comments down below. I'll be reading every single one, and in the first week, I'll be responding to as many of them as I can. Do you want to do some DIY acoustic treatment? I've got some great resources for you on that. Just just look in the comments down below. I've written articles and some of our Sonic Scoop contributors have written articles about building and placing your own acoustic panel. So definitely check out those resources. Also, Jimmy Landry, my friend from KRK, also did a great little series on building DIY acoustic panels. I'll link to that one down there as well. Some really cost-effective solutions if you're doing it by yourself. And if you're doing it commercially because you have more money and less time, then there are some great commercial solutions out there where you can find these things already built. Just make sure that you're doing some of those thick broadband absorbers to go really deep or hiring an acoustician to help you do some bass traps and that you're doing some other things to get you additional absorption at first reflection points, the point where the sound from the speakers bounces off the wall and into your ear, and also potentially that you're adding some diffusion to keep the room sounding live and fun and potentially a little bigger than it is while solving some of those problems we're worried about. 
All right, I hope this one has been useful to you. Thank you again for hanging out with me, and thanks again to KRK for sponsoring this video series. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. See you next time.